Welcome to the Actors Voice Conversations with John and Ross Conversations um, on acting and singing. Today we have, we have with us uh, Kevin Bilsma, who's a collaborative pianist and vocal coach. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio here. Uh, Kevin has more than two decades of experience as a vocal coach, collaborative pianist, choral conductor, and organist. Uh, Kevin Vilsma is a musician of impressive depth and ability, well known for his work in opera, art song, and oratorio, longtime member of the Toledo Opera staff. He's currently the head of music preparation and chorus master. He was formerly the music director uh, of the Department of Community Programs at Michigan Opera Theater and a vocal coach, accompanist, and chorus master for opera, Lena Lee. Um, he's collaborated with numerous uh, artists in, in recitals, such as uh, people like Sam Raimi and Marilyn Horn, Don Upshaw, um, and then numerous others. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the artist and artistic director of the Ann Arbor uh, Festival of Song, and for the past 26 years has served the historic Mariners Church in Detroit as an associate uh, organist and choir master. Um, Super excited to have Kevin with us today because he's dedicated so much of his career to working with the next generation of singers. So, Kevin, welcome. Thanks, Russ. Absolutely. I'm better than I think I am. So, hey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love I love these bias, especially yeah. for people we know because they, yeah. you know, we get to play catch up as we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so. I know that we've we've kind of filled you in, but we always start off by asking the the, the big question. Uh, tell us about your journey. Uh, tell us about you know how you got into this crazy business and what we do. And what a crazy business it is, especially <laughs> now. Um, really, uh, I'll try not to take too much of your time, but it was kind of a, a backwards way. You know, my career path has been more like a snake than it has been you know, any kind of trajectory. Um, in fact, just a little little story. We had a, a grad student four or five years ago at Bowling Green, who did a, a master's in collaborative work. And the, her last day at Bowling Green, she took me out for coffee because she wanted to know my career path. And within 10 minutes, I'd gotten maybe through my first year. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I just thought that you graduated and you got a job. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't work. It may work that way for some people, but it did not work that way for me. Um, when I... Uh, actually graduated from undergrad. John and I went to the same college, we went to Calvin College, and I took a year off. I stayed at Calvin for a year as a staff pianist. It was a really great experience. And I decided that I kind of needed to move away, maybe look at grad school. So then I moved to Ann Arbor and worked in Ann Arbor for a year and then applied uh, for grad school, but in organ performance. And I got in and worked for a year there but while I was working there, I got a job uh, teaching piano at Adrian College, all uh, private college, about 45 minutes southwest of Ann Arbor. And while I was there, I uh, met the orchestra conductor who was founding an opera company. Um, opera Lenaway, that's the one that you read about with the exclamation point. They, had a, they have a historic Civil War era theater in downtown Adrian called the Croswell Opera House. And he wanted to bring opera you know, real staged opera to this, this opera house where they had never done opera before. And they were going to do Carmen. And so he asked if I wanted to be the chorus master. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not ambitious at all, no. <laughs> I mean, start small and grow, no. Um, and so, uh, well, we're going to have a children's chorus too, so I had to do that. And then a week before staging was to begin, he said, well, do you want to play rehearsals? I'm like, what does that mean, play rehearsals? <laughs> for opera, he goes, well, we can't have an orchestra at all the stage rehearsals. We need a piano to fill in for the orchestra so that you know, we can push the singers around the stage and, and work on the set and blah, 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 blah. I said, oh, yeah, that sounds like fun. He goes, I'll pay you an extra $300. <laughs> <laughs> so my first gig in opera was I made a total of $1,300 for three months worth of work. And it was daily work, pretty much. Um, but I thought it was the greatest thing ever. When I started playing the rehearsals for Carmen, that's when I knew this is what I want. And I still, to this day, my favorite thing is to play staging rehearsals. And so many people in my my career, it's a stepping stone to be, you know, like a head of music preparation or something to, to coach, but also you know, play rehearsals, play in the pit, maybe a little conducting. But they use it as a stepping stone to be a conductor. And and though I enjoy conducting, my my greatest thrill is to be an orchestra just to, to experience 
the, the singing in rehearsal to experience the, the development of character within a new production, um, I just love it. And it all started with that production of Carmen at Opera Runaway. And um, one thing that I want, you know, those who have seen these, these uh, videos to know is that so much of this career is based on word of mouth. You, know, you can apply for jobs, you can put your, your resumes out there, but music is still a small industry. Opera is still a small industry in this country. It turns out that the woman who was singing Carmen at Opera Lenaway worked for Michigan Opera Theater. And she liked my work. She said, you know, we're always looking for pianists at Michigan Opera Theater. I'll arrange an audition for you. So I came in and I got hired by Michigan Opera Theater. After four years there, I was thinking of moving on. Uh, somebody who sang in as a resident artist program at the Opera Theater sang at sang small rooms at Toledo Opera. I heard I was maybe leaving. The maestro there called me up and asked if I wanted to work there. While working there, the dean at the College of Musical Arts at Bowling Green called me up and said, we have some extra money. We need a vocal coach. Do you want to come and do a little work here? And so everything has been just by word of mouth. That's kind of been my trajectory. But the whole time behind it, um, you know, I was an organ major in undergrad at Calvin, and I've stayed an organist throughout. And still one of, at least, you know, when the opera career has been a little, you know, less in time and money. I've always had the church job to help you know, bring me through. And I've been able to hire friends, you know, who are opera singers to come and sing in our chorus. So that's always been a great benefit. Um, so that, I guess, has been kind of my path. It's just a little circuitous, but... Um, no, it's terrific. Uh, so many uh, of the artists we talked to have said very similar things. Connections are everything, the people you meet along the way, the relationships you cultivate, and the path winds. It's yeah. not the tunnel to, this is what I do next, you know? And, you know, for some people, I think that it is, but for me, I wouldn't have wanted that anyway. Um, everything that I have done in my career has helped each other. You know, my uh, work as an organist has helped my score study, unbelievably. My work as a vocal coach has helped my, my choral training. You know, it just, it all works together. It's all you know, interrelated. Yeah. That's really yeah. important. Um, it, again, just being good colleagues, you know, like you guys have been from, the, I mean, I met you guys my first year at Bowling Green. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Was it that year or the next year that Marilyn Horn came? And she liked my work, so that helped me. Really, it's a monthly job at Bowling Green, <laughs> so that was great. I think that was the second year, right? Because Rusty didn't see that. No, I think Marilyn Horn was the yeah. year after I left. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. I think because uh, I was there until '05, and John was at the next. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the next year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I I remember singing for that master class. I remember Kisma singing for that master class. Joe mm -hmm. um, Joe Bonnick sang for that master class. Yeah. In fact. The aria that he sang, then Marilyn sang, um, his range. Yeah. <laughs> Hit it, Kevin, and I had to play the aria from the horn. I, like, yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, g going back a little bit further, um, what led you to be a major in music? What, what made you think this is really what I want to do with my life? Well, initially, I was going to double major at Calvin. I was going to do engineering and music. I thought uh, the you know, there was nobody in my family that was a professional musician. Music was always important to my family. And I think that my great grandfather was a music teacher, um, from what I've heard, <laughs> um, and a violinist and a violist. But, um, you know, it was always, you needed something stable to make a living. And music is not going to be that. And so engineering, that would be it. I was good at math. I was like, okay at sciences and stuff. So sure, I'll, I'll combine these two, maybe be an acoustical engineer and play a little piano in the song. And um, so I started music classes the same time as doing my beginning engineering classes. And I had this amazing calculus professor at Calvin, Jack Kuypers. He had been my mom's babysitter years ago. <laughs> and um, second semester calculus uh, called me into his office. He's like, the exam. I was like, oh no, what happened? And he goes, well, I just wanted to talk to you. I go, well, did I fail the exam? He goes, no, you actually did really well. You got an A. I'm like, oh, okay. He goes, but I heard you play the piano at the, the campus choir concert last week. Goes, you play really well. And so I talked to people over in the music department and found out that you were, you're doing double duty. You're over there and you're over here. 
He goes, why, why are you doing that? And I explained, well, because you know, stability in this business is important. He goes, well, I used to play the piano a lot. And well, then I got hired by NASA and worked in a program. And so he goes, the one regret of my life is that I let piano go and it wasn't part of my life. And he goes, don't make the same mistake that I did. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, and this guy, he was brilliant. First of all, he was an amazing teacher, but also he was pivotal in designing gyroscopes for the initial space program. And I'm like, I need to take what he says seriously. And also my passion was in engineering. <laughs> I'd go to class and I'd be like, oh, when can I go practice? <laughs> <laughs> when can I go work on my theory assignment? Because <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe that's a sign. <laughs> so I dropped out of engineering after the first year and did music at six Wow. And yes, yeah, didn't turn back. And that brings up a, a, another conversation that we've we've touched on a little bit with with some of our other guests, uh, but the role of mentors or or people who can place hold and kind of point you in the right direction. Uh, do you have more stories, people who have who really pointed you in the right place or or helped guide you through the process? Absolutely. Um, so second you know, sophomore year um, at Calvin, I you know full fledged music major, and there was a sign hanging up that said. Play for voice lessons. Make money, money, money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, remember, this was the 80s, you guys, but um, 425 an hour was the going rate. Money, money, money. Um, but I was lucky enough that um, there were only a couple other student pianists that wanted to play for voice lessons at the time. So I played a lot for both Trina Hong and for Kara Kaiser. And they both, they heard something in my playing um, that made them think that collaborative work would be something that would be, that I'd be good at. And so they took tons of time with me, you know, not just in lessons, but outside of lessons. Carl would have me come in and play for a studio class, or he'd have me, if he was, he was working on Winterreise. And so, I mean, I'm you know, sight reading Winterreise, like, I'm sure it must have been horrible, but he had me come in and sight read. You know, just so that he would have a chance to rehearse with a pianist when his regular pianist wasn't available. And those were amazing opportunities that a sophomore pianist at a larger institution never would have had. In fact, when I went to, to U of M, I also wanted to make some money playing for voice lessons. So I had to do an audition for one of the piano faculty there. And sight reading was, of course, a crucial part of it. And he put down this, this Schubert song in front of me, Am Schwanger Kronos which hardly anybody sings. And so he's like, ha he wants to know this. Well, I did because I had played it for Carl Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably should be online, but I, I, I made a couple of mistakes on purpose so that it wouldn't seem like I knew the song. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to read. <laughs> so anyway, I got the job. Um, but those two, especially Carl and, and Trina, were remarkable for me, just um, Great mentors, um, Carl especially. You know, he had been principal of the York Tenor at Hanover for a number of years. Knew the operatic repertoire, which you know we didn't do a lot of study of operatic repertoire at Calvin. You know, <laughs> um, you the next generation perhaps did a bit more, but not at the time. It was always art song, which was mm -hmm. great. It actually was you know art song that made me think if I could do this for the rest of my life. I'd be a happy person. Mm -hmm. That also was a seed of saying forget engineering, let's do music. Um, so those two, especially in my undergrad, um, in work in Ann Arbor, uh, my piano teacher, Richie Atanian, was amazing. Um, it was his first year teaching. He uh, had won the Nomberg Prize just the year before, and he got a job, a two-year appointment at University of Michigan. I, I remember going in for my first lesson, or I had to actually go in and, and schedule a lesson with him. So I'm at the School of Music, and third floor is this long hallway. And it was a Sunday afternoon, so the place wasn't that busy. It was before classes were starting. And I hear somebody practicing Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto. I'm like, OK. <laughs> I'm walking, and it's getting louder and louder and louder until I find that it's his studio at the end of the hall, and it's him practicing. <laughs> I knock on the door. Door slams open. He's sweating up a storm. He goes, are you Bilsma? I go, yeah. He goes, Monday. 8.30, lesson, got to practice, boom, doors closed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he and I could not have been further apart personality-wise, but he, 
he unlocked a lot of technical problems that I was having. Um, when I came in, I played, and he goes, you know, you're going to have tendonitis in a week if you keep playing this way. And for six weeks, had me do this very simple five-finger exercise that any time one finger was not in line with the next, if something popped out, I had to start over. <laughs> and that was my lesson. I'd come in and I'd play it for him. He goes, okay, go back and do it again. And then after six weeks, we got to repertoire. And when I got to, to play Mozart Sonata, all of a sudden, the fingers just worked. And everything was relaxed. And I was like, it was amazing. Because maybe start completely over. But he also, he, he knew what I wanted to do. He knew that I wanted to be an organist as well as a collaborative pianist. And he would find ways to use solo repertoire to enable me to uh, further my technique so that I'd be a better organist and better collaborative pianist. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'm still playing today because of him. Um, let's see, other mentors. Oh, well, my high school piano teacher, <laughs> Von Vandenberg. I would not be playing today if it were not for her. Um, I had had neighborhood piano teacher growing up who um, decided that she couldn't teach me anymore, that I was beyond what she could offer. And so I taught myself for the summer and then found uh, my mother said, well, you know, call Calvin, see if they have anybody. <laughs> and so I called all the piano teachers and <laughs> I want to study piano with you. <laughs> and Levon agreed, she had a place in her studio. And so I go to play my first lesson for her and I played the, the um, sharp minor probably of a rock mom and all, which must have been horrible. <laughs> <laughs> just kindly closed the book and said, we'll put that away for a while. <laughs> um, and started again, completely over with uh, basic technical exercises. But again, in such a nurturing way to teach that within a year, I was playing Chopin Polonaise at the, the final studio recital. And, and, and she also was big on theory. So by the time I came to undergrad, I had had pretty much freshman year theory. And it was just a review for me. So she was amazing. And I still, um, whenever I get to Grand Rapids, I try to visit her. It's fantastic. Um, and then one also really important mentor was Eugene Bostich. Um This was after my one year at, at uh, U of M, I left, did you know, opera for a while, ended up finishing my degree at Bowling Green in, in uh, music ed and collaborative piano. Um, but uh, through it all, there was the retired uh, collaborative pianist from, from U of M, Eugene Bossert, who had established the program there before Martin Katz was around. And Eugene retired as soon as he could retire. He moved in Glacier Hills Retirement Village in Ann Arbor and taught privately at School of Craft Community College. And I was working with these singers and I said, well, we have to go work with Mr. Bossert. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I came to him and he again kindly heard something in my playing that he wanted to work with me. And a lot of times we ignore the singers and work directly with me. <laughs> I had only six lessons with him, but they were lessons that completely changed my life and probably taught me the most important lesson, and that is in collaborative work, listening is key. It's all about listening. Yes, you know, it's about carrying on this conversation, but the best way to carry on conversation is to listen to your colleagues playing at the table. And that was his motto all the way through. So those I think would be my handful of the greatest mentors that I've had. That's huge. Uh, it's it's amazing to hear about those things because, um, you know, and, and some of the, they actually answered some of my questions, which was, you know, at what point um, did you really decide that uh, you were not as interested in, in pursuing the solo pianist route and uh, you started working as a collaborator? Was it was it that early? Was it college? It was college, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, first of all, was told <laughs> that I <laughs> I was told two things, and I'm not going to tell who, and John, I'll let you guess. Um, <laughs> but um, I first was told I didn't have the background to be a solo pianist. I mean, I did not start taking all of age 10. My, I have an older brother and sister. They're 16 and 12 years older than I am. And they were forced to take piano with disastrous results. So my parents decided that they weren't going to force me. You know, that, that didn't work for them. So um, if I want to take piano, you know, there'll come a time when maybe I'll ask. And between my ninth and tenth birthday, I apparently begged to have piano lessons. I'm like, well, this is interesting. <laughs> so that's when I started. Well, 
I had, I had to make up for lost time. You know, most pianists have started when they were four or six or something. Um, and so when I went to college and said, I want to be a music major and I want to be a solo pianist. And I want to play rock one off piano concerti around the world with orchestras. Um, first thing was, well, look at your hands. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see, but they're rather small and they're, they're a little pudgy. Um, <laughs> not great for playing rock one and off, okay? Um, and also, I just didn't have the experience to be a solo pianist, is what my piano teacher had said. And then one of my other teachers rather bluntly said, you're just too social of a person to have a solo career. <laughs> at first, I was a little offended. And then secondly, as I found how much I loved, especially playing the singers, I, mean, I, I really, really loved it. That I thought, well, that social aspect is kind of important. You know, it's, I can't pretend like I'm playing in another room when I have a singer right here next to me and we're trying to make music together. And so that social aspect was important. And yes, I might not have had the background to be a solo pianist, but I sure had the inspiration and the passion to be a collaborative pianist. And, um, and it was my friend, uh, Franklin Braz, who was at Calvin the same time that I was, who that was his goal. He wanted to be a collaborative pianist, and I had never heard the word before. So he introduced it to me, and I was like, well, that sounds like fun. Maybe I want that too. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. That's that's amazing. You, so you 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 found a you found a path that was just suited for you and that you loved. It's amazing. Yeah. It was su suited for me uh, both technically and also personally. Mm -hmm. So that, that was great. I was lucky. That and and Trina Han uh, happened to assign somebody Frau uh, Lieber und Leben, mm. and so the day I had to play Er der Herrlichste von allen, I was like, that was the day. I was like, okay, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> I could play this song forever and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you talked about hearing the term collaborative pianist um, in college, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on all the different monikers that we have for people that make music at the keyboard with others. Uh, do, do you have preferences for, for coach, collaborative pianist, pianist? Uh, <laughs> it's funny because uh, uh, there was this great story of Craig Rutenberg, who's uh, one of the top collaborative pianists in the world. He's on the staff at the Met. Um, he was interviewed once on one of the Met broadcasts. Um, he's saying, well, what is it that you do as you know, uh, an assistant conductor collaborative pianist? He goes, I hate that word, collaborative pian pianist. He goes, I grew up during the Cold War. Where was a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't, you know, that's become the catch-all. You know, it's better than accompanist, I guess. But first of all, I never would, will deny that it's you guys that are front and center, okay? You as the soloists are where it starts. And we are a company. We're making music together. Yes, we collaborate, but it's, you know, you're the ones that are standing out there. You're selling the goods first. And we're helping you do that. And I love that. So I guess I don't mind a company in that way. Collaborative, just it, it's fine, but it's just a little too PC in, in my mind. I prefer pianist. I just, you know, um, Bowling Green still has this, this, this thing that pops up when people have to put their recitals together, assisted by. And I don't care for that either. It's like that that doesn't describe what it is that we do in, in rehearsal. You know, it just sounds like you just kind of flew in and I'm I'm going to help you do what it is that you do. Yeah, that is the case, but we are in all in this together. So why not you're the singer and I'm the pianist? I think that's right. I love that. I don't need an adjective, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I think, uh, you know, we, we, you have all these different roles. And um, uh, I think that uh, we were talking to another coach about this. You know, at what, at what point do you start listing yourself as a coach pianist or a pianist coach and um and, and uh, i think it was i think it was sarah chiesa and she was <laughs> like you know she's i got wild and started listing myself as a coach first you know what a, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting um and, and i think it's also important that people you know who are looking to get into this industry or from outside of the industry understand all it is that um that pianists do 
um, particularly pianists who work with other artists uh, collaboratively. I know you don't love the word. <laughs> You know, I like that, that you know, pianist who works collaboratively. That's, that's, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You know, yeah, there's so much that we have to do, but there's so much that we can do. That, you know, there are so many opportunities. You know, that might not be apparent right now, <laughs> but, but really, there are so many options. And if we keep our eyes open and keep our options open, yeah, I never would have been a solo pianist. I, that was, that was actually, in, in hindsight, great advice that someone gave because I would, have, I would have just been struggling to make that happen. But, you know, it's like Richard Strauss. He said, I'm, I'm not a first-rate composer, but I'm a really good second-rate composer. <laughs> <laughs> great first-rate composer as well. But, um, you know, I, I couldn't be a solo pianist, but I can, I've been working steadily for the past 30 years, you know, to the point that that I probably take on way too much because I've had too much, too many opportunities. Too many opportunities in the music field? That's, that's, that's riches, you know, that's just marvelous. You gotta be pretty good at what you do to have that happen. Well, and again, try not to pigeonhole you. Okay, another mentor. <laughs> <laughs> the year, the gap year in Ann Arbor, I was studying with Jeff, uh, yeah, Jeffrey Gilliam. Uh, he was uh, like first year, he had also won some big prize and he was just getting started uh, teaching. And, and he was the one that told me, he goes, he goes people are going to try to pigeonhole you. They're going to try to say, oh, you're an organist. Now we know where to put you. It's like, oh, you're an organist who plays the piano. Well, do you do the piano company? Or do you do, you know, do you play for singers? Do you coach? Because honestly, Kevin, you don't have the skills that to put yourself in any of those boxes, but you have the skill sets that are going to enable you to have a career if you keep your options open. That was amazing advice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I want to backtrack just a little bit if we can uh, to talk about the interaction between singer and pianist. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and let, let's, if we can break out a couple of lists here of things that singers can do to help that or facilitate that collaboration and maybe some things that they should stop doing that get in the way. <laughs> okay. What can I, <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> Great question. I, I'm going to try not to get into trouble with my <laughs> <laughs> um, The first thing that they can do, and most of the singers that I work with, which is great, do this, they come in well prepared. No, I'm not a note basher. No, I'm not here to teach notes. And uh, there is not, well, no, that's why. There are a couple of professional singers that I've worked with that that's what I have to do. Few and far between. But I'm also trying to instill in the students at Golden Green State that that's not what my position is, you know, that that's their job to learn their music. And when we come in, then we. You know, use our mutual uh, skill sets to make better music, to make music together. Um, so you know, having everything well learned, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Providing me with decent scores. I'm, I'm still old school. I don't want to use an iPad. I don't want to you know, have to worry about whether the battery is going to go out right before the recital. So using my, my scores, OK? Um, but if that's a piece that I do not have in my library, you know, please make it two-sided and make it easy to churn. And you know, just just think about it. If you're preparing for auditions, to prepare your audition book in a way that if you pop it in front of anybody who's going to play for you, that they will be able to do their best job for you. Is I think crucial. And I can't tell you how many times, even playing, I play for the Met auditions every year, the competition pianist here in Detroit. And um, people come in with single-sided things like um, uh, Mercutio's aria in Romeo and Juliet, which is a perpetual motion thing, single-sided. And I'm like, you know, do you really want to succeed at this? <laughs> um, so you know, simple things like that. Uh, so preparation, good scores, um, a respect. Of what the pianists do and what they what they offer, you know, um, 
that we're that we're in this together. That, that this is, you know, I, I do know some coaches that view that what they have to say is, you know, this is where the buck stops. You know? This is why you're coming to me and I'm going to tell you and this is how we have to do it. And I, I don't believe that. I believe that we are on equal footing and that this communication is going to enable us to make great music together. So just, you know, being able to listen to me as well as I'm listening to you. I remember once I was working for the singer for the first time and we did this amazing rubato, which we never did again, because <laughs> talk about it. I just said, that was so great. I said, we didn't, we didn't plan to do that. But why well, listen to what you were doing? I was like, you did what? <laughs> was, yeah, you just kind of led me there and I just wanted to follow. Oh, it is two way street. That's great. And when we're both open to that kind of option, then I think that that's a wonderful thing. Um, yeah, those would be my, my my three biggest things, I think. Um, what, what do you guys think? I, mean, what... I think it's tremendous uh, uh, advice, personally. Uh, I love um, particularly the, 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 the mutual respect, the collaborative spirit. Um, whenever I work with a pianist who is, um, you know, an artist in their own right, I want their insights. I don't want to just be the singer that they're accompanying. Uh, I'm looking for that shared experience. And um, I try to teach students that. Um, but, you know, you have to have the, the first two things first. They have to be well prepared. They have to, you know, be ready to do that. Um, so and I think this is all of us. You know, I, I won't boot a student out of my studio because, you know, well, they mess up this passage and we kind of need to fix that and maybe I can help them figure out a way to learn it better you know that's that's uh, it's just you know, when they achieve a certain status it's like well, yeah, those notes should be learned or that that language really needs some work there and <laughs> you know understanding diction is another whole ball of wax <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's it's also interesting for for me and the student base that I'm working with now uh, which is very different than a couple of years ago when I was working at, you know, the, the liberal arts institutions that, that yeah. had long established music programs. And we had students who could come in and they could be prepared on, on you know, your average art song fairly readily and, and it would it'd be fine. Now we're getting a lot more students who don't know the preparation process and, and their fluency in music is still developing and it's, it's it's in its early stages you know and so getting them to that, to that level where they are proficient in the song that they are learning or have learned to a point where they can listen to their pianist and collaborate with them yeah. that is such a hard step and getting them even in, in a full semester sometimes on you know more than two or three songs yeah. is, is so so challenging to just get to get them to the place where they're outside of themselves and not worrying about is this the right note is this the right rhythm is this the right word because uh, you, you've got to have that before you're making music. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, you had, as I talked about, you know, talking with, with high school choral directors and music directors and things about, you know, how to prepare their students for a career. And it's, I, of course, I come from a, from a pianist aspect, but I think that, you know, at least basic knowledge of piano, it would help anybody to become a better musician. So even if it's only a year or something, mm -hmm. just those kind of basic skills will send them on a, on a path that one would hope that they would want to follow. No. Absolutely. Uh, it's the, the one thing that I always tell myself every year, I, I need to improve my piano skills so I can, <laughs> can better work in the studio with, with my students. And every year I go, yep, I should have done more of that. You know? <laughs> I always tell myself I should work on my voice more. So we're, we're... <laughs> But you know the the thing like like you said about establishing stages within teaching music, the thing that I never want to do is discourage mm -hmm. because to me those dreams are really precious. Mm -hmm. And you know I've had parents that have come to me saying, you know, well tell me if my student has what it takes, or my my daughter, my son has what it takes to make it music. I I can't possibly, but they have a love of this. Mm -hmm everything that I can to nurture that. Mm -hmm. I could lead them on a path that couldn't, maybe not. Yeah. No, but no way am I going to squelch that, that desire to yeah. make it. I think one of the greatest things I've seen recently um, from, from, again, colleagues and friends uh, is, um, you know, the, the posters and information about growth mindset 
and fixed mindset. Uh, because, I mean, how many of these, um, I tell my students all the time, because often I get students who, you know, maybe weren't prepared to go to a four-year program, but want to, want to take this journey, and they're just starting later. Um, and I always tell them, you know, if you're looking at, do I have the talent to do this, then you're looking at a very fixed thing. Um, mm -hmm. Talent is something that you cultivate. It's something you build. It's part of a journey. And you're just starting years late. So if you're looking around at people <laughs> who've been doing it longer, they're going to be further along that path than you are. But it doesn't mean they're better. I mean, they might be, but that's okay. Spend time with them <laughs> and, um, and learn from it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You got to grow. Yeah, yeah. And what a marvelous thing to grow in, you know. And to me, musicians are well, maybe not during the time of COVID, but just you know, <laughs> overall, my experience has been the more positive person. You know, the, you know those who have a passion that, that have a desire to make a difference. Um, happens that most of my friends are musicians so maybe that's why I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about your role as coach uh, in working with singers. Um, are there any trends that you have seen changes in the way singers present themselves uh, in preparation in interaction uh, in technical proficiency? Um. Ends. Wow. Um, I think one, I can call it a trend, is that more and more people are realizing that uh, singing, let's say singing opera, okay, or I mean, actually singing art song as well, that it ties in so many aspects of art, that, that the drama is just as important as the diction, which is just as important as the music. And in fact, maybe, maybe the words are sometimes even more important because that's where the composer began. Yeah. But I'm finding more and more people are understanding the importance of text. So that's being reflected in uh, a heightened sense of good diction, you know, that, that people are more aware that that, that is important um, and that coaches as well as singers need to be well versed in lyric diction and also understanding of basic grammars of, of the you know, nature languages. Um, and then also the, the idea of, of acting, of telling a story while you're singing. I think, you know, there was, if you look back to the song recitals of the 50s, it was the voice. And I'm not going to deny that there were some amazing voices at the time. But um, the, the way of storytelling was different. It was a little bit more, um, the music will take care of the story for me. You know, now people are understanding the need for, you know, perhaps an inventive gesture to help with the story, perhaps a facial expression that's going to bring the audience into what you're feeling about the text. So I think an idea of, of acting is becoming so much more uh, important within art song recitals, definitely within opera. Um, the idea of the body being your instrument. You know, I, I taught at Opera Works for 10 years and that was the essence of everything that handballs did is that your instrument is your entire body. So every day you work on your body with movement, with acting, with yoga, with, you know, with uh, understanding the breathing mechanism through yoga, you know, just the mind-body experience is crucial. And I see more and more people accepting that. You know, for a, when Anne first started Opera Works, that was like, she was a voice in the wilderness. She was the one that was talking about it. And now every program offers yoga. <laughs> every program offers movement. It's all, it's a collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are those are those are trends, I guess, and those are trends for the better. It'll make us all better musicians and, and and use our entire being and our entire mindset into making music. So I think those are great. Um, I think that because that so that takes so much time. Those things that I've just mentioned. That every once in a while, technical work on the voice kind of takes a back seat. I've noticed more and more singers whose careers are, are steadily shortened because of, of perhaps singing repertoire that is too big for them or just not having a basic technique when they go into their career. You, know, you need a voice teacher for the rest of your life. 
and to be your own voice teacher, but also have an extra set of ears to help guide you. I mean, Nantine Price, when she retired from, from the Met, still said, I take voice lessons. <laughs> I still have a coach. I need, this is what I need to do. You can't do it all on your own. And I think a lot of people try to, and so that's not so great. But um, that's, that's a lesser thing than the positive aspects that I see that have been part of this, this journey. Um, I absolutely love that because it's, there's so many things that you've said that um, were part of what drove me to want to um, start a series like this. Because yeah. when we talk to these young singers, um, the reason we wanted it to be conversations on singing and acting is because I inherently believe that every singer is an actor. Yeah. Uh, every singer is embodying a text, every singer is telling a story, is conveying a message. Um, and how we do that extends beyond um, just the technical aspects of our voice, but the technical aspects also have to be in place. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I love uh, that you said everyone needs a teacher and needs to work consistently with a teacher and needs to be coaching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, students hear it from us all the time, but they think we're just trying to keep ourselves in work here. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, we, uh, you know, it's the, all sides of that artistic, um, uh, of that artistic collaboration uh, have to be intact. They have to work with a pianist. They have to address everything in the music. They have to be an actor. They have to tell a story. Um, and I love that you covered all of those things in your narrative as well. Thank it also you. takes so much time, <laughs> you know? This is an ongoing, this is a process of a lifetime. It is. And, and, and to backtrack just a little bit about mentoring, probably the greatest mentors I've ever had were, I, I've at least played a thousand voice lessons in my, my life. Uh, and those have been the greatest inspirations to me. It's like, I probably have taken one bit of advice from every teacher that I've ever played for, you know? And so I have to teach a class next semester, hopefully. Um, a grad it was the, um, the grad vocal rep class, but now it's going to be vocal rep and collaborative pianists. Uh, and I'm a, in a coaching class. And I'm like, I don't know how to teach coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was asked, well, how did you become a coach? I said, by listening to a thousand voice teachers. <laughs> it's like, how do I distill that into a, you know, a 12 week semester? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so, I have some things to do. Oh, I think you, but I think you said it yourself. You know, you start them on that journey. You send them into a couple of different studios to observe those lessons. You talk to them about your journey and um, all the things they have to do and to set them on the path. But it's just gonna be the beginning of the path. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Here's the carrot and <laughs> well, that's, that's what I love about teaching is going to a teacher is really going to a curator of knowledge. It, it's not someone who's just going to pass it off, but here, here is a thousand things that I have learned. Uh, what are the ones that are important or what are the ones that show trends or guidelines that can point you in the right direction? And yeah. you can't give them everything that you know, that's an impossibility, <laughs> but, you, you, but, but, but you can kind of, guide them towards here's what has formed me and who I am as, as a musician, as, as a human being, and point you down the path because I found that beneficial. And, you know, here's where the discussion of what teacher is, is the right fit for me uh, or the right fit for the student is you want to find the person who's curating something that's helpful for you. Yeah. 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 Curiosity, imagination, and listening. You know, I, and imagination, that's probably, a, I, I feel a negative trend right now, you know, with so much of things being online, you know, like half of what I know music history wise is because I had a giant record collection right up and my parents had a large record collection and the notes for classical music recordings at the time were written by some of the greatest musicologists of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and uh, Sidney Sankey. And, you know, I'd read these notes and like I had a classmate at Calvin say, well, how do you know that the Brahms Fourth Symphony, Last Movement as a Pascali. I said, well, because I read it in the notes <laughs> and that sunk in and that, you know, cited something in my imagination. You know? It's like, learn what a Pascali is, look that up, you know? But now we get, you know, it, we, we, have, we have no notes. <laughs> we have to go to, to, to websites that may lead us the wrong way. You know, just this, this idea of developing imagination from what you read, I think, is maybe something that, that 
is something that we need to build on, something that we need to work on with, with our students. But, um, again, the access to knowledge, though, is extraordinary, <laughs> you know, more so than ever before. So if we can um, continue that and work on our imagination, all the better. Sure. I, I love it. I love it. Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, I, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you guys a question. You know, the fit of a voice teacher to a singer, like you said, that is really crucial, you know, and, and um, you know, finding you know, what way your student works best, you know, what, what mode of, of the way that they take in information is going to be best for them is, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot, you know, you got to really know the person sure. that you're teaching. Um, it's a difficult thing. So, yeah, the best voice teachers I know are also you know, some of the best people, those who are interested. In you know, I know, I know for me, um, my goal is always to, um, to, be the best person that I can and to develop a relationship with a student. And if it's not a fit for them, then that's, yeah, I don't want that to be um, something that I, that comes off as negatively because sometimes people just don't find a fit. Um, but I know I've worked with teachers and people who I genuinely love as people. And I've said, well, that's not working for me. I might have to go under the way for a teacher, but we can still hang out and I still talk to you on the regular. Um, so, you know, you have to, you have to do those, uh, that exploration. I think yeah. that's huge. I love it. And well, such a short amount of time. <laughs> a small <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's time is fleeting. I think I'm showing my age by saying that, but oh well. <laughs> No, I, I read uh, somewhere that it takes upwards of six months for a student teacher to get on really on the same wavelength mm. for it to be beneficial. Yeah. And I'm thinking about, you know, our, our master's students who now are starting with a, a, a new teacher and they've got six months and that's the school year. <laughs> you know, so their first full year is, yeah. is spent trying to acclimate. Now, I, I happen to think that that probably accelerates the, the older we get, the more we know ourselves, the more we know yeah. our instrument. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> But it's a, but it's an interesting data point, nonetheless. Like you do have to, you have to cultivate that relationship and that comfort level, um, that familiarity, uh, and that does take time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you can't just bounce from teacher to teacher or coach to coach. You have to give it a chance to to learn from that person and to find out uh, how that's going to impact your journey. I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also know that you know, perhaps not at the, the initial level, the, the high school boy student or even. You know, in college, but by the time you're in your master's, that you are in charge <laughs> of your your path, you know. And if you think that perhaps this isn't working, that you know, that's, that's up to you, or find a way to make the situation work. And that's a great point, and actually a question that I'd wanted to ask earlier, and we'd gotten away from the conversation a little bit. But at what point did you feel you had ownership of yourself as a musician, and you and you thought of yourself as a professional as opposed to someone who is learning in the process? Wow. Um, tomorrow? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that's a great question. And a little scary. Um, you know, I think maybe, I think maybe it was the year after undergrad. The year that I spent at Calvin as a freelance, in Grand Rapids as a freelance musician. Because I, I got a lot of work. I mean, I was teaching piano privately, which taught me that I don't ever want to teach piano privately. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I was I was coaching at Calvin. I was playing for the Grand Rapids Symphony Chorus. I had a couple of church jobs. I mean, I, I it, it all worked, and and I was able to make a living. So that was something that gave me a little feeling of validation. But also, um, there was a, a mezzo at Calvin, and I was playing for her, and we were doing. I think it was from Eva Galiba of, of Brahms. And we, we, she was getting ready to sing it for her voice lesson, so we practiced it. And, and we finished, and she goes, okay, what, what's next? We go, what do you mean? She goes, well, what do we do now? I said, well, um, we could work on your German a little bit. <laughs> and, it's like, and then we could work on it. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is what a coach does. And this is what I'm doing. And I think that that was the little inkling that said, okay, I, I can take ownership of this and you know, of, of the work that I do. However, to this day, I am still learning. You know, there is not 
a day that goes by that I thankfully can say, oh, I haven't learned something, you know, some new way of approaching something or, or just an, an, an attitude shift. Which mm -hmm. means, you know, and then just some way of <clears throat> better of communicating better. So yeah, ownership of who I am, but also, you know, always open to options. Like Absolutely. That. Absolutely. I, I, I viewed myself as a student well into my doctorate and, and yeah. not as I'm a professional, not as um, someone who existed outside of the university. Um, you know, I'd been working outside the university, but <clears throat> it wasn't until I lost a gig to my voice teacher. And that, that finally settled in the, you know, it, you've okay. got to get outside the student status. You've, you've, you've got, to, got to realize that this is a, a global platform you're on and you, you have to view yourself as being capable of performing on that, that level or you're sunk. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> one of the things that I'm trying to work on with, with my students is working on that student versus professional is the wrong mindset. Learner and professional, you'll got coexist. Yeah. yeah, 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 brilliant. And, and the fact that you continue to be a learner even after you're a professional is something that I think uh, is, is easily forgotten. And, and, and part of it is the way we, we, we frame those things in school. Um, so often I hear people talk about, well, you, you finish your degree and then you're a professional. And it's as if the learning stops. Right. <laughs> starts. Um, and, you know, that's, that just lends to this sense of imposter syndrome, especially in a, in a field where um, if you're not growing, you're stagnating. Yeah. Uh, because I know I was, I was getting gigs and I was doing work and I was, and I became, you know, an, an authority on some of these things and I'm teaching people, but all the time in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, can I really do this? Do I really yeah. have the authority to do this? Um, and you don't know where that begins and ends. Uh, it's, it's astounding. And so much in my, my career has just been things that I've been kind of thrown into. It's like, I don't know how to yeah. play. <laughs> well, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I've never played opera auditions before, but I have no choice because I've been told that I have to do this. <laughs> and yep. yeah, imposter completely. But then what do you do after that? You make yourself not an imposter. You do everything possible to have the skill set that the next time I am no longer an imposter. I am. And and, 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 and eventually just, you know, getting, getting past that fear and convincing yourself, no, I have, I have something to lend to this conversation and I'm going to be me and I'm going to be authentic. And, and that's going to mean uh, that I can, I can be brave and, and, and do what I need to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I don't know something, then I should go learn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh, man, the first time, I mean, I was always a good sight reader, but the first time I had to play opera auditions, it was like an hour's notice at Michigan Opera Theater. They were gonna, oh, we don't have a pianist, and we have, you know, 10 represented singers <clears throat> in the audition. And I crashed and burned. I mean, it was a disaster. And there was a moment of, you know, well, they should have known better. You know, why did they put me in that situation? And then it's like, no, you work for an opera company. You need to know, you need to know the rest. And so I went to U of M library and took out every opera score I could find, every anthology, and locked myself into the practice room practice and listened and learned. <laughs> and I still don't know every aria I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're still sight reading sometimes, right? Yes. <laughs> but at least, if it's a Verdi aria I've never done, I've played, you know, probably 60 Verdi arias. So I have a sense of style and tradition. And I need to apply that to something that I'm sight reading. So, you know, you, you, you learn that you have things that you can hang on that, that are gonna help you through it. I was getting my hair cut a couple of years ago and my, my hairstylist was like, well, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, well, I'm playing a recital that, that there's some new repertoire that I haven't done, so I have to practice. And he, like mid clip stopped and said, I mean, you don't know everything? <laughs> They're like, wow, people actually think we do. <laughs> people yeah. who are in our field think that you are able to know everything that you that needs to be known. It's like, no. And that's frightening at one point and then also exciting on another. It is. Absolutely. Oh, uh, it, it, what a. And, and it, not for anything, it's a great lesson for students to learn. Uh, I remember prepping recitals and saying to my students, I, I'd finish up a rehearsal and they said, what are you going to do now? And I, said, I have to go practice. Yeah. Practice? <laughs> and I, yeah, yeah, of course I do. 
you know, uh, probably not as much as I should, but that's everyone. <laughs> One, it was the middle of the summer, and I think it was that same year after undergrad, before master's degree, there was a pianist who was a friend of a friend came into the Grand Rapids. She was a uh, semi-finalist for the Van Clyburn competition. And she was looking for every opportunity to play her recital program. And so there were six of us who were in Grand Rapids in the summer. And so we opened up the, the recital hall and she played for us and you know, we, we got to listen. And we finished and I, and I was like, well, do you wanna go grab a drink or have, have dinner? She goes, no, I, I need to practice. I, I know what went wrong in this recital and I just need to go and fix those things. Mm -hmm. like, practice after giving a recital. That is probably the best time to practice. <laughs> That's amazing, you know? <laughs> For the pianists like that. that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Singer's toast. <laughs> Singer has to think about those mistakes for another day. And right. Fair enough. Well, uh, I, I think we're, we're probably uh, getting about to that point for our last question. Okay. I'd say so. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Why, that flew. <laughs> flies. It really does. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I'm sure we, we could probably talk for another hour without it feeling like another hour, but I'm not sure our, our viewers would uh, right. would hang oh, on with we'll us for, for another a, hour. We'll save it for a part two. We'll, we'll do a follow-up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but our, our, our last question always winds up being, uh, do you have any advice for the, the young musicians, the up-and-comers, those who are just starting off? Mm, don't give up. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you have a dream it may be an absolute ridiculous dream, like wanting to play Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto with orchestras. But it may open a window to possibilities that you never could have imagined would work for you. Um, again, it's full of stories today, but um, I was playing for a benefit at Toledo Opera. This was like 15 years ago. And the chairman of the board at the time was, was British and his wife was on a number of international charities. And she came up to me after I played, she goes, Kevin, I've been wanting to talk to you about your last name. Said, oh, no, it's not. Well, yeah, but I just don't tell that to anybody because they don't know what I'm talking about. Friesland is the northwesternmost county of the Netherlands. And that's Smuz, Struz, I don't know about Tenbrink. I don't know where that's Tenbrink from. is Fries. Okay, hey, brother. Oh, the, the family is Fries. The, the name actually winds up being a German military name. It gets complicated, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, she said, well, what does it mean? I said, well, it means ax man. <laughs> she goes, oh, that makes sense. She goes, Henny, she goes, one of the charities I run is in Amsterdam. It's run by Henny Steensma. She goes, Kevin, the Fries are terribly stubborn people. <laughs> <laughs> Notoriously stubborn. Um, and it turns out that I am too. And I, I was always, you know, berating my family. My, my grandfather, I think, was the most stubborn person I have ever met. But there is an amount of, of tenacity, of stubbornness that is necessary in this field. And so trust yourself, trust your dreams, but also just be stubborn about, you know, if this is something that you want to do, find a way to make it work. And don't allow people that are discouraging because there will be people that are discouraging you. There may be people that are jealous of you. I don't know. But to you know, go with what your heart says and then trust yourself, trust your friends, trust your teacher. Find a teacher that, that you know you can confide in and that works for you. And those would be my things. And study piano. <laughs> Great thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, is, is there a preferred uh, contact method if anybody wants to hit you up for uh, coaching? Oh, absolutely. Um, probably just email uh, the kbilsma at bgsu.edu. Sure. And we'll, we'll toss that in the, uh, uh, the description I'm, of the video. I'll have a website as well. If they wanna, you know. we'll, we'll make sure people know how to get a hold of you. That's a absolutely. Thing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, guys. This was really, really enjoyable. It was a good time. Willing to see what great work you guys are doing.